Okay, I think we'll get this underway. We're a couple of minutes past seven now, and people coming in, but we'll get moving. So, welcome everyone. Welcome to the second public industry webinar update for the Varroa Response. I'm Danny Laferve, and I work for the Australian Honeybee Industry Council. I'll be your host tonight. The Australian Honeybee Industry Council, or ARBIC, is the national representative body for your industry. Our membership base includes peak associations from every state, the Amateur Beekeepers Association, Crop Pollinators, Plume Breeders, and Honey Packers and Marketers. ARBIC is the signatory to the D and is the, gov the D that is governing the response. And we've been involved in the response since the start as industry liaison officers, alongside representatives from the New South Wales Apris Association and the Amateur Beekeepers Association. I just want to acknowledge the team working behind the scenes tonight, especially the work of Bianca Giggins, our Varroa coordinator at Arbic, and the public information team from the DPI, including Joe, Ali and Mark. Without those guys working behind the scenes, um, there's no way we could run a webinar. So the program tonight uh, we're going to hear from a range of speakers. I'm going to give an overview from the industry council perspective of the response. We hear from Jamie, a, res a response resilience officer, about beekeeper wellbeing. Chris will give us an overview of the response. Shannon will give us a surveillance update. And then Nathan Carter will talk about the Wild European Honeybee Management Program. And at the end of that, we'll have a, a Q&A, a live Q&A session. So just walk through some housekeeping. As I said, Arbic is hosting the WIS webinar tonight, and we're a not-for-profit organisation. We survive solely on the gener generous donations from beekeepers. We don't receive any money from levies. So if you're on here tonight and you're not a friend of Arbic, I encourage you to jump on the website, honeybee.org.au, and click through the links to become a friend of Arbic. So tonight we're going to have some 500 people online we had nearly 800 registered to attend. So as you can appreciate, we're not gonna be able to just have an open floor for questions tonight. However, we really wanna hear your questions and we wanna see them. So there is a Q&A function on your screen. If you click on the Q&A function, you will be able to type in your questions. Those questions will go to the team in the background. They'll theme up the questions and send them through um, to the speakers at the end of the session so we can answer those questions. Now, we're not going to be able to answer all the questions tonight, but we will take them away and we'll make sure they're used to form the ARBIC and the DPI communications in the future. So please send through your questions. So this webinar is being recorded and it will be published online. So it's important to remember that the information that's presented tonight is current as of the 11th of May, 2023. And if you're watching this sometime into the future, make sure that you do go to the websites, either the ARBIC website or the New South Wales DPI, dpi.newsouthwales.gov.au slash Varroa to get the most up-to-date information. It's really important. So I'm gonna kick off tonight by talking about some of the common comments that I hear uh, around the traps. Comments like, uh, you know, let's just transition and get on with it. We're sick of not knowing what's happening. We can manage Varroa, they do everywhere else in the world, so just let it go. Eradication has never been achieved anywhere else, so why even try? Why do we need to euthanise hives? Can't we just treat those hives and treat away Varroa, quarantine those hives? And clearly with the new detections, the horse has bolted, so let's just shut the gate and walk away. So I'll try and provide some information that'll inform those comments and those questions moving forward. So the first one to address is the transition to management and what that might look like. Now we know that no one knows exactly what transition to management will look like in this response, because it's a plan that once decided by the CCEPP, the lead agency being the DPI develops the plan, then it's negotiated and agreed to by both the consultative committee and the national management group. But what we can talk about is the principles of biosecurity and that will guide and give us an idea of what it might look like. So in this response early on, based on the information in the early delimiting work, it was decided that it was technically feasible to eradicate, eradicate, where I might, and cost beneficial. 
the CC, CCEPP and the NMG make that decision and that's revisited every time they meet, um, which is quite frequently. If at some point in the future, there's enough data coming to the CCEPP that makes it undeniable that it's not technically feasible to eradicate, then a management plan would be put in place. Given this response in the way it is, that management plan is most likely to look at trying to contain the mite for as long as possible, because we, we're fairly confident that it is contained in Newcastle. So what does a containment plan look like or an containment strategy? Well, it's likely that a containment strategy will still have zones. So the current zones are probably the most likely to be used and maintained. There'll still be movement restrictions in and out of those zones. You'll still be restricted about what can happen in there. And it's unlikely that bees will be allowed to be moved in there and back into those zones in the short term. There'll still be uh, requirements for the blue zone beekeepers to log and do movement decorations, as well as alcohol washers will still be mandated to do reporting to monitor any spread. The New South Wales DPI is still likely to be doing surveillance around the purple zone and into the blue zone to monitor that containment lines. The borders are likely to shut and stay shut and sealed until they find mites in their states. So in summary, the transition to management plan based on those biosecurity principles is not likely to be a lot different to what, where we are now. So the comments I hear about let's transition, let's lift all the restrictions and move on and get on with it is not what's going to happen. We can look at New Zealand as the example. They decided earlier that they couldn't eradicate, but they put containment plans in place and containment lines moving to slow the spread. They were able to slow the spread for 15 years until it reached the end of the South Island. Um, and so they also put those rules and regulations in place to continue to slow the spread. So to address the question about um, around the management and how it's managed overseas and, and what, so why can't we just manage it like they do? I've looked to New Zealand for an example, being the most recent incursion and similar traits to Australia. And the, and the key difference is, is the feral bee hives. So we know in New Zealand when they had the detection, the first detection of where I might, it was estimated the colony density was about 20 hives per square kilometre feral bees in the landscape. We know in Australia it's much higher. Peer review uh, papers have suggested between 77 and 96 hives per square kilometre in our landscape. Now, not only does that make it really complex for a response and eradication, what it means is in our landscape, if we were to let this go, we have a source of colonies that are unmanaged that will allow the mites to breed up to very high numbers. The managed colonies around those feral mites, once they are unprotected, whether that be from treatment or, or whatever the method is, if they're exposed and unprotected, then they will be, they'll be very quickly reinfested from those feral bees. So there'll be a continual cycle of reinfestation from those feral bee colonies. What we also know is that once a viral mite establishes, about 90% of those feral bee colonies will die in two to three years. So until those feral bees are removed from the environment and we've got an equilibrium, we're going to have this constant pressure of reinfestation on our managed colonies, which is going to make it much harder for us. Hive movements in New Zealand, they're much smaller drops, moved a lot less. In fact, some hives don't even move. Australia has bigger drops, moves the hives a lot more across the country. So if we were to let this go, the spread of the mite would be much quicker than what we see in other countries, even with containment in place, because of that level of hive movements that we have. We'll have troubles, we'll have trouble around treatment methodology. New Zealand has long brood breaks and short honey flows. So it gives them that break in the varroa breeding cycle in those hives over winter, which knocks the numbers. But then the short honey flows give them opportunities to use the existing chemical treatments during the, the summer and spring months. There's parts of Australia that have no brood break, continual brood all year round, which allows the mites to keep breeding up all year. Long honey flows, some places have 10 to 11 months, which is going to be problematic for treatments. Profitability is another key difference. When, when Varroa was detected in New Zealand, they saw an exodus of beekeepers, but very quickly because of the Manuka gold rush, beekeepers came back into the industry. And in fact, the hive numbers raised higher than what they were post Varroa very quickly. In Australia, our beekeepers are dealing with declining honey prices, cheap imported honey, a series of natural disasters, all in the face of rising operational costs. So 
we expect that our numbers of beekeepers exiting the industry once the variety establishes will be much higher than other countries because of those pressures. And the last point there is to talk about the biosecurity system. Australia has a gold standard in a global um, level for biosecurity systems. And we have a shared funding arrangement and a shared decision-making model. New Zealand has a, a primarily government-funded biosecurity system. Uh, and so their decision-making process was different. Australia has a very long history of being able to eradicate very hard to deal with pests um, successfully. And so if anyone in the world is going to be able to eradicate a varroa, it, it's going to be Australia. Chris is going to talk a bit later and in, into a lot more detail about those, how those other countries have dealt with varroa. What I do want to talk about is colony health and being formed as a, as a group in the US that does the census across their industry. The key difference is the US does have deformed wing virus. And so far in Australia, we haven't detected that. So hopefully the, the impacts won't be as severe. But what this graph is showing is the blue columns and the overwintering losses, that the overwintering losses in the US is sitting at around 30%. Now they've had 20 or 30 years to deal with varroa and build the, the treatment methods and breeding and all that sort of stuff. And they're still dealing with 30% overwintering losses. Now you could say, well, those overwintering losses could be for a raft of reasons. This same study asked those beekeepers why they think the cause of those overwintering losses were. Over 60% over 60 of those respondents said varroa mite was the number one reason for those, high, those colony losses. So varroa will change the face of beekeeping. The same study pulled apart what those, commercial, what those beekeepers did. So commercial beekeepers, sideliners, or not quite full-time beekeepers and recreational beekeepers. The point I wanna make on this slide is that it's not just, varroa won't just be a problem for the big end of town. It won't just be a problem for commercial beekeepers. You can see on this slide that recreational beekeepers are, are heavily impacted by varroa mite. In fact, the annual losses in the US is 55% of backyard beekeepers are recreational beekeepers. So half their colonies are dying every year. And so that's gonna change again, how we beekeep. So if we come back to, the, to New Zealand. Again, New Zealand has to form wing virus. In 2015, when, they, when the spread of the mite moved right across the island, they started doing the census to look at the impact it was having on hive health. You can see on this chart that every year, the colony losses increased. 2021, 13.6% colony losses. What's really important is if we look at the bottom here at the, the uh, footnote that says recreational beekeepers had 21.6% losses in 2021. Again, varroa mite just won't be targeting one sector of the industry or the big end of town. It is a whole of industry problem it will change the way we beekeep. Beekeepers at the moment in Australia, we have the luxury of, of having minimal intervention in hives for honeybee health. With Varroa, we'll have to continually be intervening in the hive to maintain the health. In fact, in the initial stages, we're likely to be keeping those hives on life support to make sure that they stay alive. Every beekeeper I speak to in the, around the world, which I speak to a lot now, that have varroa mite, talk about if they had their time again, when they had an opportunity to eradicate, they would throw everything, including the kitchen sink, at eradication. They are saying now that the mites, year on year, are getting harder and harder control. The honeybee health, the health of those hives, year on year is declining. And they are finding it more and more difficult and just wish they could turn back the clock. So we have a chance to eradicate at the moment. And I think it's really important that we take it. So if we look at the question around euthanizing hives and, and can't we just quarantine them and then manage, manage away the problem. These are two graphs that I've grabbed out of some peer reviewed papers. The colored graph is showing the organic treatments that are available. The black columns showing the, the synthetic treatments. What's important here is showing that the percentage of mite mortality None of the recognised treatments that have the scientific research over a long period of time have 100% mortality of mites. So currently, there is no method, proven method, 
that will remove 100% of the mites from any colony. So similarly to AFB, American fowl brood, there is no treatment to fix the problem. So the only way of achieving eradication, unfortunately, is euthanizing hives, which I sympathize with every beekeeper that's had to do that and euthanize in those red zones. I also sympathize with the DPI staff who are out there having to do that awful job. But it is, there is no other way. And Chris will talk about how they try to achieve it in other countries because that's what they did as well. So tonight, you're going to hear from the response team. You're going to hear that eradication is still the goal and that the response is on track and that there is confidence that eradication is possible. You will hear that there has been a mountain of work done and even a bigger mountain of work still to do. You might hear tonight that the new detections in the purple zones are expected and that we, in fact, are even expecting to see more detections as we move through the process. That is part of this eradication process. Tonight, the team will only be able to scratch the surface of the data that has been collected. And you'll see only a small slice of the tracing work that's, that's occurred. But there is a mountain of information and tracing work sitting behind the scenes. And it's that detail and understanding that gives the teams the confidence moving forward. So it's really easy to sit on the sidelines and throw stones and criticize the response and say, it's not possible. But, it's, but this team is running the largest plant pest response that this country has ever attempted to achieve. And it's not without its risks and its issues. So we know it's not all rainbows and unicorns out there, but for this to be successful, it has to be a team effort. It has to be a whole of industry effort. And like I said, it's not without its risks. The biggest risks that will determine the success or not of eradication, I've summarized in those three dot points, distilled into those finer points. So removing the host species from the zone, removing honeybees from those red zone is critical to the success of this program. The funding of the response, which is largely out of our control, but in the hands of the, the consultative committee to do, agree and fund the response moving forward. Without that, eradication is not possible. The biggest one that as an industry we can influence is the compliance and human movement of varroa. If we apply peer pressure and talk positively and talk to our peers about the importance of adhering to the rules, as hard as those rules can be to adhere to, that is what's gonna give us the best chance of eradication. So if we can manage those risks, then we have a good chance of eradication, but it is gonna take a whole of industry effort to do so. So that's my really short spiel. Thank you. So now we're going to move on to, um, we're going to hear from our response resilience officer, Jamie, who's working in the DPI, and he's going to talk about beekeeper wellbeing. Sorry, give me one second. Sorry, Danny. Right. You see that slide show? Yep. Beautiful. Good evening, everyone. Thanks, Danny. Um, I'm here to talk about the role of the response resilience officer and also about the well-being. The Varroa mite emergence response. Oh, just give me one sec. Not quite sure. Right. We're here to help communities and individuals affected by the Varroa mite response um, for the impacts of the biosecurity um, emergency. We have two response resilience officers, they being JD Magna and myself. Uh, we're here to help with navigation of reimbursements with the Rural Assistance Authority. Um, 
We also are here to help with connections with health and wellbeing services, ramp, farm, farm gate counsellors, Beyond Blue, and many other um, health services that are available. We're also here to connect with rural financial counselling services, farm household allowance for the commercial, and there's a variety of charity um, services out there that are available as well. We acknowledge that this emergency response has had a deep impact on beekeepers, both recreational and commercial. To all those affected, there are many services that are out there to assist you if you're feeling this, the effects of this response. Jody and I are available to speak with you if you're feeling upset, confused, uh, and we can help guide you to the right person to get the assistance that you require. There are many health services out there that can assist you. Uh, most importantly, if you can start with your local GP, that's a great starting plan. They can help set up a plan, schedule follow-up visits to ensure that your wellbeing is looked after um, for the future. Alternatively, on our website, and regular newsletters that most of you would be receiving, hopefully all of you. There is a link um, in there, it's called Assistance, for, Assistance Guide for Beekeepers. That will navigate you to our website and it that lists many health services that you can talk to over the phone. New South Wales Health Hotline is available 24 seven. RAMP is also available to provide you with a range of information services. Um, to individuals, communities, and service providers to link people um, that are in need. Um, there are other services like Beyond Blue, Lifeline, um, and Men's Line that you can call if you just want to talk to somebody, if you're not comfortable talking with your GP. They have a team of trained staff who can listen and guide you in the right direction. The website also has an online resource. Um, there's a couple of them. One of them is Are You OK? It's a downloadable mateship manual that you can have um, download onto your computer that you can read at any time. Um, all these services are free. Uh, for commercial beekeepers, as I said before, there's services such as rural aid and rural financial um, counselling services, as we are aware that the current situation um, an emergency response is having an effect on a lot of the um, commercial businesses and also recreational that um, are trying to run a small business as well. Um, just to wrap it up really quickly, talking to somebody, whether that be a fellow beekeeper, your local club, um, Jody or myself are always available Monday to Friday um, to take your call, or a health professional is important. It is confidential and most importantly, valuable to your health through this emergency response. Um, please um, have a look online. Um, if Call us, call JD and I, if you do want to discuss, we can try and guide you to the right direction, um, but your GP is probably one of the best to speak to because um, they can set up a plan and give you help. So, thanks, Danny. Thanks, Jane. Uh, so it's really important that beekeepers, like we understand that there's beekeepers in the red zones that are, are really copping the brunt of this, the front line. So it's really important that beekeepers that are struggling uh, do reach out and do look for help. Um, this is stressful for a lot of people in the response and none more than those beekeepers on the front line. Now we're gonna hear from uh, Dr. Chris Anderson Varial Coordinator of the New South Wales DPI. Chris will give us an overview of the response. Just get me, get that shared up there. Right, hopefully everyone can see that. So, um, look, what I would like to do tonight, uh, first of all, is just thank Danny um, and everyone for the opportunity to present. Um, I'd like to give uh, the people online the chance to see what a biosecurity response is and what biosecurity is uh, and why we do it and what's involved in it. Um, and, and the main message that I want to get out across out of this presentation is um, why uh, we're doing, oh, sorry, 
So I just notice there's some problems with the way that the um, presentation's coming up. Just give me a second, I'll try to fix that. It looks like your screen's frozen there, Chris. Right. Let's try again. Get rid of that. It doesn't seem like the, the previous presentation didn't share properly either, but I think you can at least see the whole screen now. Um, so. It's not making any difference. Okay, anyway, um, so the purpose is really to give you an understanding of what biosecurity is and what a biosecurity response is. Um, and hopefully, you'll see that the approaches to biosecurity in the US and New Zealand and Australia are exactly the same, um, but there have been some key differences in our detections and our responses. Um, and that's been, uh, that's been the main difference that you see. Uh, and it's the reason that we continue to respond. And it's the reason that the USA and New Zealand uh, took different approaches. Still having trouble with this. I'll try again. This isn't great. Technology is great when it works, isn't it, Chris? Yeah, I've never had this problem before, so it's a bit odd. Usually you can click that button and it will present, but it doesn't want to present. Uh, okay, so that's looking better, um, but there are some mistakes in this presentation which I updated this afternoon, so you'll just have to bear with us on that. Um, so yeah, let's move on to the next slide, please. So Australia and Australian biosecurity, obviously we occupy a unique place in the world. Um, we have a complete sea border around our country. Um, and that's why you might remember um, that uh, the very famous ad um, involving a very famous Australian who's no longer with us, um, one of the greatest Australians to ever live. Uh, and he, he talked about quarantine matters um, and he held up a, a little tiny bug and talked about the damage that it could do. Um, unlike a lot of countries that have land borders, we have the ability to keep pests and diseases out of our country. Um, and that gives our primary industries, um, our community and environment an advantage over the rest of the world um, and enables us to promote a clean green image um, with the produce that uh, we sell, that we grow and sell. Um, so since 2005, uh, we have had a strong and well-funded collaborative system in place to manage biosecurity threats. And that is something known as the Emergency Plant Pest Response Deed, which is a deed of agreement between um, primary industries and governments across Australia to manage and deal with biosecurity threats, um, so such as diseases, um, insect pests, uh, bee pests, as they come into the country and to respond to them. And that's something that no other country in the world has um, to the extent that we have in Australia. Um, if you wouldn't mind clicking the button. So the other thing that we've seen, um, just go back to the previous slide. The other thing that we've seen is 
um, along with that uh, implementation of the um, deed of agreement to manage biosecurity threats, are a number of jurisdictions, both at the state level and the federal level, have invested in um, new biosecurity acts. So legal powers to help us um, implement our responsibilities in terms of uh, containing and, and managing and potentially eradicating biosecurity threats when they come into the country. So this is this is the context that we are responding to Varroa mite within. Many people are completely unaware of that um, if they're not usually involved in biosecurity issues. Next slide, please. So what is biosecurity? Well, technically there are, so, there are four actions that we implement um, across biosecurity. Um, our, our goal is about managing risk. And we do that, um, when, we, when we detect a pest, we do that through the delimitation or you know, putting a ring around it, um, containing, uh, eradicating, and where we can't contain and where we can't eradicate, then it, the responsibility is on biosecurity organisations to make sure that there is an orderly and a controlled um, management program put in place that assists in minimising the impacts of um, these pests and diseases on our uh, on our economy, um, community, and environment. Next slide, please. So our role in biosecurity um, through biosecurity legislation and as biosecurity organisations is assisting um, the country to avoid biosecurity impacts by stopping them from coming in. And when they get here, it's about minimising those impacts. And if we can do those two things and do that well, then we've succeeded. If we fail to do that or we do it poorly, then we need to look at where we can make improvements. Next slide, please. So this is just a, um, it's a generic curve that's often seen when you're talking about biosecurity. Um, and, and what it shows is uh, along the bottom there are the economic returns that diminish over time the longer that a new invasive species is present uh, in an area and also the increasing cost that you get the longer that species is present. Um, and so prevention, as I mentioned, is about stopping it from coming in. Um, but when it arrives, and that's where the arrow is pointing, you are here, that's where we're, we're at at the moment with Varroa mite. Um, our role is to delimit uh, to contain um, and to attempt to eradicate. And that's that's where we are at the present moment um, before we consider what comes after that. If we were to just walk away from it and just to let it go, you can see quite clearly with these things, the cost to the industry, to the community and the environment skyrocket. Next slide, please. So this is just an example that's not bee related, but to try and give you an idea of how the biosecurity system works. So fall armyworm is a, a pest um, that attacks a large number of different crops. Um, it can fly 300 kilometers a year on its own. Um, and it was detected in the Torres Strait and TNWA in 2021. Click the button. So for a pest like this, early warning systems are critical. Um, and when that pest was detected in the Torres Strait, um, it was brought to what is what is known as the Consultative Committee on Emergency Plant Pests. So that is a technical committee, a committee of technical experts from all of the affected industries and all of the relevant government parties um, that are seeking to manage uh, that particular threat. Click the button, please. So that committee met. Um, and it, it looked at uh, the situation around fall armyworm. It took its biology into account. It said it can fly 300 kilometres a year. It cannot be contained. Therefore, it cannot be eradicated. And they agreed very quickly that it was not technically feasible to eradicate. And so what came after that was a coordinated approach to education, to extension, um, the setting up of early warning surveillance across the southern states, because at that time it was only in the northern states. Now it's been detected in Tasmania. Uh, and the result of that approach, that coordinated and targeted approach around fall armyworm, was that it, um, it reduced the impact. And we don't see the major impacts in Australia from this pest um, that they see in, in places like Africa and, and Southeast Asia, where it decimates crops. Next slide, please. So 
that committee that I mentioned, the Consultative Committee on Emergency Plant Pests, that's your um, committee of technical experts for the Varroa mite response consists of technical experts from 16 different industries that are affected potentially by Varroa. Uh, and that is includes the bee industry, obviously, um, and then a whole range of industries that you can see there um, who have a reliance on bee pollination to produce the to produce um, fruit and vegetables. Uh, and in addition to that, there are um, technical experts from all of the state and territory governments uh, and the Commonwealth. Next slide, please. So what I wanted to do here um, is start to look at the American, um, the American response and to contrast that with the uh, New Zealand response and then to look at the Australian response. And so I wanna start off with a quote um, from Malcolm T. Sanford, uh, who was well known in uh, varroa mite circles in the US. Um, and, and he says, and this is out of, out of a publication that um, he wrote called The Two Decade History of the Varroa Mite. He says, in recent years, I've recognized the emergence of two populations of beekeepers, which I characterize as before varroa or BV and after varroa, AV. The AV folks really have no idea of what beekeeping used to be like for us that are in the BV community and shouldn't for the landscape has inalterably changed with the introduction of the varroa mite, except for a few places like Australia. So if you're sitting on this meeting tonight and you're from Australia, you are in the BV club. You are in the before varroa club, except for a very small portion of the industry that has been affected by this. And so we can talk to people who are affected, we can see what the impact is on them, and we can look at the people who are not yet affected, and we can see the costs um, that are mounting around this, this mite and what it potentially will do to the bee industry and to pollination reliant industries in Australia. Uh, next slide, please. So in the US, um, Varroa was detected on the 25th of September, 1987. It was discovered in Florida, but it was in colonies that were owned by a Wisconsin packaged bee supplier. Um, and in response to this, Mexico and Canada slammed the borders shut a little bit like uh, Victoria and Queensland. Um, and a moratorium was placed on the movement of beekeeping equipment. Um, there was a USDA led delimiting surveillance that was implemented to assess the situation. So remember I was talking about delimitation and containment being some of the first steps that biosecurity organizations will put in place. Well, that's exactly what happened um, in the US. Uh, click the button, please. So by October 20, one month later, um, 19 of Florida's 67 counties had positive fines for the mites. So that's an area of approximately 51,000 kilometers squared. Uh, and by November, the USDA had found the mite in Florida, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. So now we're talking about 460,000 square kilometers. Within two years, mites were found, found in 19 states within the US and are now found in all states. So in spite of all the regulatory effort noted above, it was too late. The varroa mite literally was everywhere and no amount of expense or effort would limit its spread. The beekeeping industry was embarking on a road to chemical treatment. Next slide, please. So management, what has ensued in the US is a history of miticide resistance to chemical treatments and widespread annual colony collapse that has worsened over time. The USA no longer sustains wild colonies of honeybees. Approximately 20 to 30% of the national apiary was lost after Varroa came in. And bee survival in the US is under real and ongoing threat perpetually. So this is just a summary table. You can see um, the date of detection, the, the large area over which delimiting surveillance determined that Varroa had already spread after only two months. Um, the estimated time was that it had been there is greater than five years. It was not possible to contain it. Um, it was not possible therefore to eradicate it. And the only option that was left in that situation was management. Next slide, please. So the detection in New Zealand occurred on the 11th of April, 2000 in the Auckland area um, and limiting surveillance was commenced. 
it was found initially across an area which is approximately 30,000 square kilometres um, around Auckland and, and that part of the North Island, um, and eradication was abandoned. However, the New, Zeal New Zealanders took an approach to implement a containment line uh, on the North Island. That containment line was breached by 2003. Most of the North Island was infested by 2004. Um, and in 2006, there was Varroa detected in the South Island. Um, and most areas are infested uh, in the South Island by 2015. So what they see in New Zealand, um, despite the fact that they were able to slow it and contain it, is that nowadays treatments are becoming less and less effective. Um, the organic industry in New Zealand has been all but decimated. Um, and there are half the number of commercial apiarists now managing the hives in New Zealand because a significant proportion couldn't maintain the requirements to manage Varroa. Um, and what we're seeing uh, on advice from Nick Taylor and Martin Lars is increasing colony losses, which is the graph that um, Danny showed earlier. Next slide, please. So this is just to put up the New Zealand experience. Um, so we're still dealing with uh, a significant area, 30,000 square kilometres after two months that delimitation had determined. Um, the estimated time uh, that Varroa came into New Zealand was three to five years prior to when it was detected. Um, there was containment put in place, so the answer to that was yes. Um, for around three years to the Upper North Island, there was a containment line that was held. Um, but because of the significant spread, um, eradication was not possible for them. Um, and so they eventually had to move to management right across New Zealand. And that's what we have today. Next slide, please. So the, our experience, what have we experienced? Um, well, we detected Varroa on the 22nd of June, 2022. Um, and it was detected by the National Bee Pest Surveillance Program, which is a surveillance program um, that has been uh, run across all states uh, and as uh, you'll see um, sentinel beehives uh, that are placed around ports of entry and they're placed there to detect varroa mite predominantly but also tropolalops mite and other um, viruses and diseases that affect bees. We implemented a well-prepared and an industry vetted eradication strategy based on a port detection. Remember we have the emergency plant pest response deed um, we have a, uh, a, a bee industry that is well across biosecurity, unlike a lot of the other countries that encountered Varroa. And so we were able to coordinate an approach and we had pre-prepared strategies to put in place that had been vetted and agreed to by industry. Next dot point, please. Um, so what we're seeing now is that the highest mite levels are currently around the earliest infested sites, including Newcastle and the Central Coast. And the new IPs that we're detecting um, indicate a very recent infestation. So it may only be one or two mites that we're pulling out of an apiary. Um, so it, it truly is the very edge of the infestation. So we've had, um, unlike other countries, 2,114 people contributing 47 years worth of work hours in 10 months. Um, I, I, I challenge anyone to try and get your head around that. That's the effort that we've put into this. Um, and that has enabled us to successfully uh, put a ring around where this is and to have full confidence in where it is not. Surveillance, um, so alcohol wash and sticky mat based methods that have been conducted by our response team field, uh, field teams 39,934 surveillance events to date. Um, next top point, please. And we've had 83,482 hives tested negative um, for using uh, industry supplied alcohol wash data. So both industry and government working together to get a clear idea of where this is and where it is not. Um, and that's an incredible collaborative effort. And just today, we ticked over 10,000 calls to the hotline. So this is just some of the um, surveillance. What you see here are yellow crosses, which are negative 
sticky mat surveillance events and black crosses, which are positive sticky mat surveillance events. Next slide, please. So a slightly closer view of the Newcastle area, you can see the black crosses in the more heavily infested areas and around them are lots and lots of yellow crosses indicating that we've got um, a good handle that it is not creeping out by, beyond these zones, but it is contained within them. Next slide, please. This is industry led alcohol wash surveillance. So this is the alcohol wash surveillance that is legislated in New South Wales. And these are points on the map that have been generated by um, recreational and commercial beekeepers complying with their legislative requirements to do that alcohol wash surveillance and report it. You can see a huge area of New South Wales is covered by that surveillance and all of that surveillance is negative. Next slide, please. So the response strategy that we're attempting to implement here um, is to shrink back these zones as best we can. Next slide, please. So the idea is to, to turn red zones into purple zones and to turn purple zones back into blue zones. Um, we are confident that uh, one of the first areas that we'll be able to do that in will be in the Narrabri and the Nana Glen areas. Um, and then we will focus on getting that sequence of events in, in place um, across Newcastle and the Central Coast. It sounds simple, but it's not. It's not going to be simple. It's going to be messy. It's going to be something that will go on for some time. Um, but we have set ourselves an ambitious goal with that, and that is to do this by June 30, 2026, in the first instance. Next slide, please. So here you see the Australian and the New Zealand and American um, attempts at, ma at managing that varroa mite risk. Each each scenario is different. The areas that were found to be infested were significantly different to one another with Australia having by far the smallest area with 9,450 uh, square kilometres after 10 months, not 30,000 after two or 460 after two. Um, we, we estimate that it came into Australia probably 18 months to a maximum of two years ago. Um, and we think or we know that containment is possible because we have contained it. Um, eradication is in progress. If you don't mind just clicking the button once, please. Oh, go back. Oh, that's all right. Just go back to that slide. Um, so we, we know that our eradication is in progress. Will it go to management? We don't know yet. It's too early to tell. We need to give the eradication time to work and to assess that data. Um, this is a quote from Michelle Taylor, international internationally recognised expert. Um, writer of the Bible on managing Varroa in New Zealand, along with Mark Goodwin. Um, and, and that is that no one else has been able to uh, conduct a coordinated approach as what we have done in Australia. Um, it's very impressive and we've definitely minimised the impact by localising and maintaining it, giving beekeepers outside of these zones time to adjust. So even just through the containment, you can see how important that containment is and will be for the future of Australian beekeeping. Next slide, please. So to date, as I said before, we've seen over 2,000 people contributing more than 47 years worth of work. Next dot point, um, the removal of wild bees um, is a key aspect of our eradication campaign for varroa mite. You need to remove that host. Um, you cannot treat it. It needs to be taken out um, to ensure that those mites are removed and they're stopped from spreading um, to healthy bees in other areas. Uh, and we need to give this time it takes time, it's a long process, uh, and we need to assess the data as it comes in. We have an expert panel, including internationally recognised experts in bee population dynamics and varroa invasion, who are assisting in guiding decisions alongside with our tracing experts and our epidemiologists uh, within the department. So our role in biosecurity, as mentioned before, is about initially delimitation and containment. And that's what we've been doing. At the same time as that, we are ramping up the eradication processes in the background to try and remove that varroa mite from the environment. Um, and at this point in time, it's too early to say whether we move into that transition to management phase or not. We need to give it time. We need to assess the data. We're about preventing or minimizing biosecurity impacts. So I want to finish with this quote um, from NZ Apris, John Berry. 
uh, he's he's one of the guys in New Zealand who has seen it all. He was there at the beginning and he's experienced it and he knows what's happened. And he says uh, in the April Advocate, August 2nd, 2022, I was one of the very few at the time who advocated for eradication. I believe then and I believe now that even if we had to kill every hive on the North Island, it would have been worthwhile in the long run. Time has proved me right. And we're now in a situation where synthetic pyrethroids no longer provide adequate control in some areas. And even when treatments do work, the viruses spread by the Varroa are still killing hives. So that is what we are staring down the barrel of if we just let this go. If we walk away from this, that's what we're looking at. The loss, the loss of up to 90 to 100% of wild bees across our country. Um, you know, Danny pointed out the lack of a, of a serious brood break in most of Australia. So we've got Varroa mite reproducing in hives constantly. And as that first wave of Varroa moves through, um, it will decimate the wild bee population. What will be left will be the hives that beekeepers have been able to successfully manage. Those that they don't, they will also be lost to that first wave of Varroa. Um, so it is the very, this is a very serious threat. It's probably the most serious biosecurity threat that the country has ever faced. Um, the impact on our ability to produce food is is significant and it's it's beyond anything that we've ever seen. Um, and we will continue to attempt to eradicate. Uh, there was a, there was a quote another quote that I wanted to put up to, to finish this talk, but that was essentially that those um, who stand on the sideline and say that it can't be done are usually interrupted by those who are doing it. So let's get behind the response. Um, let's do the right thing and let's try to see an Australia that is free of Varroa. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, really good presentation. A takeaway point for me is that uh, <clears throat> this response plan wasn't made up on the fly and it is based on some previous precedences of how it's done overseas and, and industry agreement prior to, to this incursion. So that's really good. I think another key point, Chris, to point out there that your list of the CCEPP members, the technical experts that you listed there, they are also the same group of people that are paying for this response. So this response isn't just paid for by government. It's a shared funding model that is shared across all those, those group of experts, those industry partners, as well as government to pay for this. Thank you, Chris. So now we're gonna move on to hear from Shannon Mulholland. Um, and she's gonna give us an update on the surveillance program and where we're at. Thanks, Danny. Right, let's see if I have any more luck sharing my screen than the other guys have so far this evening. Um, as Chris has really been setting the scene for what we are attempting in this response, um, tonight I want to give you a bit of an update on where things are up to over the last 10 or 11 months of work, not only with the work that the response team has actually been participating in, but also the, the really good work that the industry has been doing to support the response efforts. Um, all of the data that I'm presenting to you today is uh, has been generated through our planning team and our mapping and epidemiology experts. Um, and it really showcases how hard we have actually been working over the last uh, 11 months of the response. The image on the screen at the moment is one of the varroa mites that we have found during the New South Wales incursion. So that is our target. Um, our goal is to see them gone from Australia in the very near future. We are fortunate in this response um, that we have only seen the varroa mite, not the varroa mite and viruses. To date, we haven't detected any of the exotic viruses that we know varroa can transmit. Um, and the reason that that is a good thing is because it makes it a far more complicated emergency to deal with because we're dealing with a parasite in a disease. At the moment, we're just working with the parasite. It is a difficult beast to tackle. So um, that's, that's one silver lining of what the situation that we're dealing with in New South Wales can provide us. The reason that this is so important is it's not just about the honeybee industry. It is about Australian agriculture at large. The honeybee industry is worth around $170 million a year. And it's a really important industry because it underpins a lot of the pollination that we need for our agricultural crops. It also supports our environmental biodiversity and uh, just general ornamentals in our, in our community, in our gardens, in our parklands. We have a $14 billion pollination industry under threat from Varroa um, due to the, the compromised ability to service that pollination need. 
And we can certainly see from international experiences that when they start losing wild honeybees and even in their managed hives, that does have an impact on pollination. We are a very large, widely dispersed country. Our agricultural crops are quite distant from each other. So having those managed hives in, in the system to service that pollination need is really critical. Uh, and Varroa threatens that. We only have one shot at eradication. We want to throw everything at it that we can whilst we have that one shot. We cannot wait and we cannot come back in a year or two or three and go, maybe we'll try again. It's too late. We've got one chance and that's why we're throwing so much energy into this response at the moment. The couple of ways that we are managing the response at the moment is uh, a lot of surveillance, a lot of surveillance. And we will see surveillance in New South Wales and in other states and territories around the country, specifically for Faroa, uh, for the near future. The response itself will require several years of surveillance to make sure that we do have it contained, make sure that we don't have detections out in the blue zone, which is the remainder of New South Wales. And there's a, a lot of surveillance that goes towards that proof of freedom once we reach that stage. We, we can't just claim that we have eradicated Varroa. We actually need to prove that. And there's set targets that we need to meet to be able to prove that we have achieved that goal. We also need to remove the hosts. And so that involves the euthanasia of managed hives and feral bees in the red eradication zones. And we need to make sure that we're communicating this to industry and to the general public and to the community so that you understand what it is that we're trying to achieve, how we're achieving that and what that progress looks like. The map up on the screen at the moment is quite busy, um, but I have deliberately put that together with all of the surveillance data that we have to date from industry and from the response teams to demonstrate how much work has gone into that. Every little single symbol that you can see on the map right now represents uh, people out there looking at hives, specifically looking for Varroa mine. Uh, the blue crosses are the alcohol wash data that industry needs to provide us at the moment. It is really, really valuable passive surveillance data. And we really need you to keep checking your hives on that regular 16 week basis and reporting those results back to us. It spans um, a significant portion of the state, high numbers of managed hives, and it's really important data to support the response. We've also had response teams uh, heavily focused within our eradication and surveillance zones, but also scattering throughout the blue zone. And we will see those teams move more and more into the blue zone over the coming months. Uh, but their work is really vital in supporting pollination events, checking the blue zone for Varroa, and then working on that delimitation surveillance around those red and purple zones. Um, as Danny and Chris have mentioned already, um, we do feel that it is a, a contained outbreak at the moment. Although we have had detections in Narrabri and Nana Glen um, and up around the Tari area, they have been the result of hive movements that have taken Varroa to those places. We know when that happened, we know how that happened, and intensive surveillance in that area has not detected further Varroa in those areas. And that is a really good outcome of that surveillance work. Where we have been focusing most of our attention of late is in that Hunter Valley and Central Coast area. Whilst we do recognise that it is largely contained in those areas, we are still firming up the very edge of that eradication zone. When we are seeing new detections, that is because we are pushing teams into areas of high risk. It is not that it is running away from us. It is just that that's when we're focusing attention on particular areas and we are detecting the mites. We've seen a lot of reports coming through from industry on their alcohol washes. And as we have been able to promote that program and help beekeepers understand what that work looks like, we've certainly seen an uptick in the number of hives that are being checked and the reports that we're receiving. What we need from industry is for you to keep doing that. It's really important information. And it's giving us really valuable scientific data because of the numbers of hives that you're testing, the numbers of apiaries that you're testing, but also the size of the apiaries that are being tested as well. We're also looking at movements of hives across the state. So for those of you who have already uh, attempted to move hives in New South Wales in recent months, you'd understand that there is a hive declaration portal uh, for movements in the blue zone, or there is a permit system for other movements. And that is allowing us to understand who is moving hives, the size of the apiaries that are being moved around, where they're being moved to. And you can see on both of these maps, 
um, that there is a, a pattern of where those hives are existing and that correlates quite strongly to where we're getting the alcohol wash data. So that's also a good sign. We're seeing surveillance happening in the areas of the highest apiary densities. Uh, this is something that we're going to continue to track quite closely because it's really important. And using both the permit system and the hive declaration system is also very useful. If we do have a detection and we do have any of the purple or red zones expand, we can go back to those records and understand what beekeepers may have been in those areas and we can follow up directly with them for further surveillance. When we started on the sticky mat surveillance, um, there was quite a focus uh, to prepare for uh, significant surveillance events in the southern parts of New South Wales. Uh, that was to support the almond pollination event, which was important for beekeepers, but also for agriculture. When the miticide strips and the sticky mats arrived in the country, we were able to do some side-by-side -side trials with the alcohol wash testing, which was the method that we were using initially in the first couple of weeks of the response. Uh, to make sure that we had the right techniques for deploying them and we had the right levels of sensitivity for that testing method. The sticky mats and miticide strips that we're using now, that is the gold standard for our surveillance and it's highly sensitive. Uh, initially, the uh, technique for using the alcohol wash surveillance, uh, we had a sensitivity of around 70 to 80 percent. Tweaking that procedure, we believe that we can get that sensitivity up to about 90 to 95 percent. And it is a really useful tool for detecting varroa mite. And it was certainly responsible for a lot of the positive detections in the Newcastle area in the early parts of the response last year. Um, we've since moved to sticky mat surveillance. It operates at around that 90 to 95% sensitivity rate, which is exactly what we need for this kind of work. But it allows surveillance of the entire hive. Um, the alcohol wash is a sample out of that hive. And whilst it can detect varroa mite, you're still only detecting it in that sample. But once you start surveying on a regular basis and you start surveying statistically significant numbers of hives, it becomes a really useful surveillance method. The sticky mat surveillance is something that we can um, deploy quite quickly and quite easily across a large area of time. And we have a really good sensitivity rating for that, which is why we use that as our standard surveillance method nowadays. During September and October last year, there was a huge push on euthanasia of hives in the red zone around Newcastle. We know that that is um, sort of the epicenter of the outbreak and we do have varroa mite in those areas. And so we wanted to work on a suppression strategy before we started to move into the warmer months of spring and summer. So there was a little bit of a dip in the amount of surveillance that we were conducting in those months as quite a few of our teams were deployed to do that destruction work. Uh, we then shifted back into large periods of surveillance and you can certainly see an uptick in the size of those columns for what we've been achieving over recent months. Uh, that doesn't include the, the May data that we've had to date over the last couple of weeks, but that sticky mat surveillance is ongoing. And we're getting very close to um, finishing that first round of surveillance in those key areas. Uh, what we've been working on over the last couple of months is what's been coined our summer strategy. So the main objective of our summer strategy was to define the very edge of those red zones. Uh, you can see the number of symbols on the map, particularly the yellow crosses, that represents our sticky mat surveillance. And you can certainly see that there's sort of waves of activity in different parts of the Hunter and Central Coast uh, based on objectives that we were trying to clear those zones and trying to understand what was happening in those areas. At the moment, we find ourselves in a position of uh, trying to focus our efforts on the northern, western and southern parts of that Newcastle area. We really want to be confident that we do have the edge of those red zones uh, clearly defined. And we've been deploying a lot of activity on the Central Coast uh, as well. So defining that northern, western and southern part of the Central Coast boundary. Um, many of you would be aware that we've had uh, further detections on the Central Coast uh, within recent months. And you can certainly see that represented on the figure for the large amount of surveillance that's happened on the very bottom part of the Central Coast and into the northern parts of the Sydney Basin. It's really important that we understood that there wasn't varroa widespread in those areas. And although I have heard a few people mention, you know, what happens if it gets into Sydney, that's it, we're done. That's not necessarily the case. Throughout the entire response, as Chris had touched on earlier, we're looking at whether this is technically feasible to eradicate. There is a scientific assessment that we apply in these sorts of biosecurity emergencies, and it assesses a number of parameters about where we're confident that we can detect it, contain it, and manage the the pest. Um, 
we have repeated that uh, assessment numerous times throughout the response, and we're still deeming that this is technically feasible to eradicate. We will continue to repeat that review and assessment uh, as the response moves on, um, particularly if anything changes with the situation, because we want to make sure that we have clear visibility on where we're up to. Uh, we're primarily deploying sticky mats as our main surveillance method, uh, but there has been occasions where we're looking at brood inspections, we're taking bee samples, we're testing those bees for other viruses and other mites, including trophallalaps, and we've also been collecting some wax and honey for MRL testing um, to make sure that the mitocide strips and the way that we were using them was safe, and that's been confirmed as the case. Um, we're certainly prioritising any cases that might be linked to an infested premise or is close to an infested premise, and that's a really key part of our tracing work. Whenever we find a new positive site, uh, we undertake the conventional tracing work, but we look in the nearby area as well. Um, there's a little figure, which I'm hoping will work in a second, and it's a demonstration of what we've been achieving with our tracing and our surveillance efforts and about how we're pushing into new zones based on that tracing information. Now, I have added a number of moving lines on the map. They are not linked to any particular premise. I just want to put that caveat out there first. There are lines connected to the suburb or to the general area in the red zone. They are not pointing at any particular IP, even if the line accidentally is landing next to it. So I just wanted to put that caveat on there and hopefully this will come up, but it just gives a bit of a demonstration as, as we're finding new sites, we're pushing into new areas. And that's why we sometimes see the teams, they seem to be jumping all over the place, but they're actually on a very targeted mission based on that information that we are obtaining through that surveillance work. And there is a little bit of jumping around to be able to chase down that, uh, that evidence, but that's precisely what we need to be doing in this situation. The vast majority of um, positive sites that we are finding in this particular incursion, they're related to the movement of infested bees and hives. And that's been mediated by us. We are the ones that are moving those bees and those hives around. And that's why we have seen some large jumps, um, say out towards Narrabri and Nana Glen, um, down to the central coast. Um, but it's, they all link back to that original Newcastle area. And we do believe that it was in that general Newcastle vicinity was where the outbreak has actually started. Uh, there has been a small degree of natural spread that we believe is happening where we haven't um, linked those particular properties through the movement of a bee or a piece of equipment, uh, but they have been very, very close to an infested premise. And so we would expect that if the mites have been present for long enough, that there would be a small amount of natural spread. But we're seeing that um, in, as very small distances. It is not moving you know, tens of kilometres. Um, it's certainly confirming for us the need for the permit and the hive declaration system because it's allowing us to look at those movements and to assess the risk. Uh, and we certainly have increased the compliance pressure. Um, we want beekeepers to be doing the right thing. We want to make sure that they understand what is required of them. And if we have any concerns, then that is referred to our compliance investigation unit to follow up. Uh, with any biosecurity response that we work on in Australia, we have a pretty standard method of following up an infested premise and then looking at any of the other sites that might be at risk. Um, you may be familiar with this through the COVID situation, with you know, tracing. Um, it's exactly the same thing that we deploy in our biosecurity responses as well. We want to have a look at any premises that are connected to an infested site and we want to trace forward and we want to trace back. We want to understand what other sites might be at risk that we need to follow up. Uh, so that's certainly the approach that we've deployed for the last six, uh, sorry, for the first six months of the response into the latter half of last year. And it worked very well. We were finding many IPs. We were getting a real handle on where this thing was and certainly where it wasn't. Um, but that allowed us to provide a, a huge amount of information that we have been able to analyze and assess further and, and learn from that experience, understand what was happening. What we're doing now, um, and this has certainly been related to an uptick of infested premises over the last couple of months, we're still focusing on those tracing links. That's not gonna stop, it's really important. But we're also looking at a two to three kilometer proximity to an infested premise. We're looking at shared sites, we're looking at shared equipment, we're looking at extraction facilities, we're looking at business and people and community networks because from all of the information that we've generated through the response, that's how we've determined that the mite is spreading. They are the high risk activities that we need to be paying attention to, and that's what we need to be chasing down. Um, 
we are trying to prioritise surveillance in that blue and purple zone, particularly in the purple zone. But there will be instances we will send teams back into a red zone um, just to double check something and to confirm a tracing link where we need to. Um, and we have set epidemiological targets that we need to reach in the purple zone in particular to make sure that we've actually conducted enough surveillance. We don't want to do too little and risk, uh, risk missing a cluster of mites. Um, so there's, there's large numbers of, of sites that we actually need to inspect to make sure that we haven't missed something important. Uh, and we really are pushing our teams in a very strategic manner now into those higher risk zones. And, and that's why we're finding a lot of IPs. The, the red zone did expand on a couple of occasions quite rapidly. And I know that was concerning for people, but that was precisely what we predicted was going to happen based on the tactics that we were using at the time. And it is a good outcome because we need to find every site that has mites. If we miss huge areas of mites, that will compromise eradication. We need to be very methodical and very thorough on this effort and chase down every lead until we've exhausted all possibilities to find them. Um, it's also really important that we, we manage the host material, in this case, the European honeybee. So that is achieved through the euthanasia of managed hives and then baiting, although I'll leave the, the baiting on for Nathan to discuss later. Um, but we've, we've managed to clear around 90% of the hives from the red zone already. Um, and you'll see that the, the yellow diamonds represent where we have been operating. Uh, the main areas that we are still working through are along the edges of the red zones, and they typically relate to recent expansions of the red zones. So once we have um, finished our surveillance and our tracing work that we need to be working on in those areas, then they are handed over to our euthanasia teams to go through and work through those particular locations. So what have we learned? We've been doing this for 11 months. Um, surely we've picked up a couple of things along the way. Obviously, beekeeping in Australia is a highly mobile industry and it is dispersed across a huge geographic area with a lot of travelling involved. Um, transmission is happening in many ways. It's not just a bee and a hive issue. It's to do with the entire network around beekeeping as well. And we need to be conscious of that to make sure that we have the right tactics in our surveillance program. The vast majority of beekeepers are following the rules. They are doing the right things and they really understand and support the eradication process. Um, we're very conscious of the fact that this is a fairly confronting and challenging response, um, but the vast majority of industry is, is doing the right thing and is doing everything in their power to support the response. Um, Danny and Chris have touched on the risks if we do not achieve eradication. And, and I think that's not lost on the people in the room this evening. Um, and we do need to be making sure that we have credible and accurate information going out to the community. Um, we do have a public information office that is dedicated to, to working through this constantly throughout the response, and that's not going to stop anytime soon. Um, but we do need to be able to challenge misinformation when it's, when it's portrayed, because we want to make sure that people are given accurate information, and that's what they can base their decisions on. Um, just to finish off, um, look after yourselves, look after each other. This is a group effort. Um, there is pain involved for the industry, uh, but we're conscious of the, the future pain down the track if we don't achieve this mission. And that's really what we're fighting for. We're fighting for that bigger picture and we're fighting for the safety and security and the ongoing well-being of the Australian honeybee industry and Australian pollination industries as well. It's a really important mission. Uh, it's something that you don't get to see very often that is coming down through feedback from industry and from other state and territory jurisdictions, but they really recognise the hard work that we're putting into the New South Wales response. Um, certainly recognising the sacrifice that we're making locally as well on behalf of the rest of the country, but your work is really valued. Um, so keep up the great work with checking the hives, keep reporting that through and keep finding positive sites. We need to find every single last one and we'll keep working on that. Um, as long as we possibly can. All right, that's all me done. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, Shannon. Um, yeah, we're really getting down to the details now. We can see the amount of work that's happened in the response and that it's following a methodology. It's not just looking um, across roads and driving down streets looking for hives. There is methodology in that tracing and the amount of work that's happening behind the scenes that really no one gets to see is phenomenal. Um, so thanks a lot, Shannon, for that explanation. 
Um, I have seen the occasional hand pop up from participants. Now we can't take questions off the floor with the hands. If you have questions, please put them in the Q and A. We're getting a lot coming through. We're trying to answer some directly, uh, setting some up that will be answered at the end. So now we're going to hear from uh, Nathan Cutter. Nathan uh, is the project, the program lead for the Wild European Honeybee uh, Management Program. Thanks, Danny. Um, can everybody see that presentation? I hope so. Thanks, Jamie. So good, every, good evening, everyone. Uh, this presentation, as Danny said, is going to cover the Wild European Honeybee Management Program. And that's being conducted as part of the National Varroa Mite Response. Wild European honeybees, as we've called them, are just European honeybees, uh, but they live in the wild. They build their nests in structures like tree hollows and rock crevices, other enclosed spaces. And this makes them um, often really difficult to find access and of course manage. And as we heard from Dr. Anderson um, earlier, despite the difficulty of this task, these wild bees have to be eradicated from all of the Varroa mite emergency eradication zones or the EEZs. And that's due to the risk that these bees are a host for Varroa mite and they can assist in the, in the spread of that. So throughout the response, DPI has um, been vigilant in collecting intelligence on the location of wild European honeybee colonies. And when suitable, these colonies have been tasked to commercial pest controllers and managed with commercial insecticides uh, like permethrin. However, many of these hives are unable able to be treated due to access issues. Consequently, the problem of wild European honeybee management call for another approach. Just go to my next slide. So this is why we've adopted the use of a specialized bee feeder station to attract and manage wild European honeybees. And this bee feeder station has been designed in collaboration with industry professionals such, such as Steve Fuller, bee researchers such as Dr. Madeline Kratz, Liz Frost and Dr. Michelle Taylor uh, through her research in New Zealand and also state and Commonwealth chemical regulatory agencies like the EPA and APVMA. Bait stations are designed to exclude other animals and insects and to prevent contamination of soil and water. Uh, they're placed in a network grid after consultation and agreement with landholders, but not closer than two kilometres from the edge of the surveillance zones. Bait stations are monitored for the presence of off-target species during both free feeding and during our insecticide application phases. A grease strip or petroleum jelly uh, prevents crawling insects accessing the station. Uh, the steel cages can be placed over the um, bait stations to prevent access by uh, humans and animals, other animals. Um, although the bait stations are labelled with fipronil chemical uh, label stickers, uh, this is by law, fipronil is only temporarily placed in the feeder stations. Once uh, the insecticide does its work, the fipronil is removed from the station and fipronil is never left in stations overnight. Uh, all of these stations, um, we have over 600 of them now deployed, uh, are maintained and managed by trained and accredited staff under the program. So we've uh, done a lot of work in attracting, using attractants to specifically attract wild European honeybees to these uh, feeder stations. So essentially we use a sugar syrup solution, usually about 60%, although our permit allows us to do a variety of concentrations depending upon the bee's needs. Uh, we spray a, a honey and water mixture around the bait station. Uh, we heat and mix um, uh, a mixture of um, like propolis, uh, radiated honeycomb and, and honey and um, we can actually do this for, you know, usually we'd only do it for 20, 20 or so minutes, but um, we find in some places we have to actually do that for an hour to get those scout bees attracted in um, into the bait stations. We use commercial European honeybee pheromones and also pollen and propolis uh, patties um, 
as a mixture of things to attract bees in. I'll just um, play this video of a station once it's um, operating. So you can see um, that's a station with a lot of bees at it. Um, and that's, that's really the, the aim of it. Uh, once we receive um, or observe in excess of 300 bees at a station, it triggers us uh, to use uh, the fipronil. However, in subsequent uh, cases, we might um, use fipronil when we, uh, we, when we plateau at the numbers of bees, um, because in subsequent, um, subsequent applications, you're going to get less bees. Uh, this series of images just provides an outline of the fipronil application process. So normally uh, during the morning, the feeder stations are filled or refilled with sugar syrup and bees are attracted to the sugar syrup. They consume um, the, the neat sugar syrup. Um, once we plateau with numbers of bees being attracted in, we apply a uh, sugar syrup with a 0.01 gram per litre of sugar syrup uh, fipronil um, spike into that um, sugar syrup. And then um, the bees quickly uh, become impacted by the fipronil. And we can see that in about 45 minutes. Within two to two and a half hours, the program is finished. Uh, we no longer attract bees into that, uh, that um, station and we remove the fipronil and dispose of that through a chemical um, uh, so th through a um, chemical disposal agent. And what we do then is we uh, collect any of the fipronil, fipronil impacted bees and we do alcohol washes to determine if any of them are carrying varroa mite. Here's a um, couple of pictures and a video of a wild bee colony that was nested in a tree at Tumbiumbi and it was close to one of our feeder stations. So you can see the, the colony is quite open and it made it an ideal um, opportunity to document the impact of fipronil. So on the 2nd of May, not too many days ago, fipronil was applied to um, a feeder station and we used a large white cloth under the tree to collect bees. So um, subsequently we found no bees, uh, no mites, sorry, uh, falling out from that, um, from that hive in the first day. Neither did we find them on the second day. However, on uh, the 4th of May, we actually um, determined at that's at 48, 48 hours post spike, um, they started to show up with mites. And it's particularly relevant that the younger bees at the, uh, at the end of this um, spiking program, 48 hours after spike, uh, were showing up with mites um, and a number of those bees were also um, found to be drone bees which are known to be more um, more favorable to the mite. Um, here's a picture, here's a video of the hive prior to spike and you can see the picture post spike there. Um, so the feeder stations are generally deployed on a three kilometer grid across an eradication zone in some areas such as Nana Glen, we've had a high density of stations deployed. A two kilometre buffer area protects managed bees um, in the surveillance zone or the purple zone coming in contact with our feeder stations. So as I said before, over 600 feeder stations have now been deployed. And to date, we've had 557 fipronil applications in those stations. And as stated earlier, we do use uh, permethrin as well, where we can with commercial pest controllers. A few things on fipronil. Uh, it's an insecticide that's registered in Australia and has been since the 90s, uh, mid 90s. Uh, it's used in both agricultural and veterinary use in about 200 registered products. I just wanted to raise your attention to the fact that fipronil is found in uh, flea and tick treatments for dogs and cats. It's used in um, tomato sides uh, to protect uh, buildings and so forth from termites. It's used for cockroaches and ants. Um, it's also used in brassica crops, banana crops, um, potatoes, grapes, a, a variety of different uh, crops um, use uh, fipronil to protect them from insects, pest insects. 
And the concentration of fipronil in our feeder stations is far lower than the concentration used in current home and garden products. In fact, uh, fipronil treatments for small hive beetle uh, have a rate of 48 grams per kilogram, which is about 50 times the concentration uh, we're using in the rural response. Um, it's also used for the control of ants in parks and gardens, sports fields and lawns at uh, 50 times the rate we're using it in our bee feeder stations. So it's a fairly safe product and we're using it in a very safe manner under a um, Commonwealth Health label permit. So throughout the program, we've worked with uh, the relevant Commonwealth and state agencies to ensure we're not um, impacting on any, any species like threatened species. We've particularly uh, looked across our eradication zones for any list of threatened species and we've found a couple that uh, potentially could be, like the giant, giant dragonfly and the regent honeyeater. Um, we've worked with Dr. Ian Baird to, to identify uh, giant dragonfly habitat and we've placed bait stations or our feeder stations outside of those areas specifically. And we've um, looked at the regent honeyeater and other threatened species and uh, just the level, it's, it's a predator of, um, of honeybees. Uh, so they're um, relevant to their diet. We've found that um, if you look at the LD50 for the regent honeyeater, you'd have to, um, you'd have to feed a 40 gram bird with around 300 uh, grams of bees or 7.5 uh, 7 times its weight to, um, to lead to a lethal dose for 50% of, um, of the population. So that's just um, making it clear that those threatened species aren't at risk from the program and the Commonwealth and state have looked at, uh, looked at our work and agreed to that risk assessment. Um, we've also worked with OSQUAL, uh, an organic certifier. They've done some post, um, post fipronil um, assessment of crops in the Nana Glen area and not being able to find presence of fipronil after we've worked in the Nana Glen area. Um, fipronil has a half-life, quite, quite a quick half-life in the open environment, 12 hours in water. Uh, so that would be a half-life uh, disposal of fipronil within 12 hours exposed to water or 34 days when exposed to UV light. But DPI is measuring fipronil levels during our work um, to, to look at field, uh, field um, assessments of the degradation of fipronil. Um, just to outline where we're at with native bees, our, our field teams are trained in the identification of native bees. Uh, recently, a Central Coast resident requested treatment of wild bees at their property. And once inspected, our staff identified these bees as teddy bear bees and halted the treatment by the pest control contractor. So although native bees are often observed by wild European honeybee management teams, uh, in the open environment, they're rarely observed in feeder stations. However, when native bees are observed at, a, at one of our stations, the station is shut down to prevent further recruitment. So uh, in Nana Glen, we recently uh, did a spike uh, with fipronil and 20 minutes post spike, we noticed uh, that native bees turned up at the station. We shut down the station, packed up the fipronil um, and cleaned down the, uh, the station. So um, essentially we're aware of native bees we, um, we're not targeting them. It's actually against our permit to target uh, native bees. So people who keep uh, European honeybees will sometimes witness native bees, um, such as Tetragonula carbonaria that, that, that are entering their, their hives. But these are usually in very small numbers and they're usually, um, we feel, well, from, um, from feedback from our biosecurity um, bee biosecurity officers, they're probably collecting resin, but not actually interested in um, taking or robbing uh, honey from those hives. Uh, we feel also that once European honeybees, which compete for floral resources in these zones are removed, native bees will have less competition for the flowers to forage on. 
And furthermore, we're anticipating seeing less of the stingless bees uh, coming into winter as they don't really forage above uh, 18 degrees Celsius. Um, just, uh, I hope I've got time. I've just reached my 15 minute limit, but um, I just wanted to cover that we're also trialing uh, the use of fipronil alongside the response and um, we're conducting um, studies to evaluate uh, hive strength following fipronil application to assess the concentration of fipronil within a hive after fipronil application and determine uh, the, uh, the times to mortality, the trip frequency and the payload volume of fipronil of, of these foraging bees. Um, you can see, I hope you can see in that picture um, marked bees. These are bees that have been marked at our fipronil um, feeder station and then subsequently found in, uh, in the hives of the tr uh, treated hives at 500 metres. This was a trial we did at Denman. Unfortunately, we had to stop this trial as we detected mites on one of our, um, one of our mats in, in the hive. But um, this is some of the HPLC and GCMS um, studies from that work. You can see the top chart there is a um, laboratory sample of fipronil. And then um, you can see in the, in the middle uh, chart there, fipronil is spiked and detected in the hive, which is an objective assessment that fipronil was present in the hive that, um, that had that impact on that, uh, on that efficacy hive. Uh, the bottom chart there is a, um, is a GCMS um, result, but we've, we've determined that HPLC is a better measure. Just to continue on there, uh, we've done our second phase of fipronil for efficacy trials in the central coast area, putting out eight hives around, um, around bait stations at 50 metre, 500 metres, 1,000 metres and 1,500 metres away from our, um, bait, uh, our, our feeder station. Um, to date, this is uh, just preliminary data, but to date, two uh, replicate hives at 50 metres um, from the feeder station have been killed or impacted. The 500 metre uh, distance is still under assessment. At one kilometre, both of our hives have died. And at 1500 metres, um, we're still waiting on results there as well. One of the things you should note is that we are um, putting uh, miticide strips and mats into these efficacy hives. And um, just to, as Chris said, to uh, the presence of um, natural spread of um, mite in, bee, in, in the um, wild bees, we are actually picking up um, mites on the mats uh, placed into those. So the result where we pulled up in Denman early may have just been um, phoretic mite, but um, we closed down that trial. In the central coast, we know we have, um, we know we have mites in the, uh, um, in the wild bee population. So we're going to continue these. They're well inside the red zone and not at risk of spreading outside of that um, emergency eradication zone. And that's a video of the uh, efficacy hive after treatment and collapse of that hive. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Nathan. Um, yeah, some really detailed information there and a great presentation. Now we're running way over time and we are gonna do a Q and A towards the end, of, we'll do it now. Um, so I understand if people need to leave, but this again will be recorded and posted online so people can see it afterwards. Um, there is a, a big flurry of questions coming through on the chat. Um, a lot of them are being answered by the team behind the scenes, but Nathan, we're getting a lot of questions around fipronil baiting and, and some comments about, you know, the environment and, and what impact it, it may have and what mitigations we're putting in place. Mm -hmm. I, do, I, I do note though that, you know, we can look at Nana Glen as a case study and Nana Glen was baited and then we've moved in hives to assist with pollination and those hives aren't dying from fipronil. Um, so we know that the, 
that it's not persisting in, in the environment for a long time. And we can also look at examples of where fripp this fripping or budding, because it's not something that this response has come up with. It's been done before. It's been done in the Queensland responses when we had incursions there of both Asian honeybees and, and, and varroa. Um, and we're not seeing the long lasting, or we didn't see the long lasting impacts of frippinol there or that off target damage. It's also been used in New Zealand. So, have you got any comments about that and, and what future work we're planning, you guys are planning to do to try and justify that? Yeah. So, Danny, thank you. You alluded to the Nana Glen work, and uh, we put out um, fripronil on a two kilometre grid as opposed to a three kilometre grid, so a higher density of bait stations and fipronil application. Um, you can see, uh, as you said, the, um, the pollination hives that have been moved in there are not only surviving, but thriving. And um, according to Rachel McKenzie, have resulted in a really good pollination result there. Um, we're actually continuing to use fipronil in the Nana Glen area with a two kilometre buffer around any of those pollination hives that have gone in there. So the two, um, knock on wood, the two uh, programs are working side by side um, effectively at the moment. As I said, uh, we've been really careful with um, environmental um, impact. We're working with National Parks and Wildlife Service um, in, in a lot of cross tenure in, in park. Uh, we've worked with experts in species, threatened species to mitigate risks. And to this point, we haven't impacted any uh, of any um, off-target species with fipronil. Um, there is some short half-life uh, that fipronil has, and that's um, been seen in New, Ze uh, New Zealand research as actually beneficial to their viral mite um, program uh, because it does stay there for a short period of time and sop up any uh, robbing bait, robbing wild um, European honeybees. So that actually is part of our program, but it does have a short half-life. And as I said, we are um, measuring field, we're doing field assessment of um, the persistence of fipronil. Although it does degrade very quickly in soil, in water and under UV light. So I hope that allays um, people's fears a little, but there are published, um, reviews by the APVMA that are available um, on the public record as well. And just quickly, uh, Nathan, just explain half-life for people that don't know what that means. Yeah, so half-life is a um, sort of a chemical degradation um, measure. And it, so if you've got a compound that um, that is active, at, um, so our active ingredient insecticide is fipronil, um, in a given period of time, um, it's the half-life is um, the rate at which you um, have half left. So uranium, uh, for example, has a very long half-life uh, in which it stays active, but it degrades to, um, to other um, less uh, reactive substances and, and the same with fipronil, but it doesn't last as long as uranium. Um, and as I said, um, I'll just go back to my, um, my slide. Um, in, in water, for example, fipronil um, has a 12 hour half-life. So, so in 12 hours, um, if you've got say X grams of fipronil active, you'll have half that in 12 hours time. Thanks Nathan. Uh, another question that's come through is just clarifying the number of bait stations we're expecting to deploy across the zones. Yes, so we're projected to have around 800. So we've got over 600 now. And so we're well on the way to full deployment. Um, unfortunately, of course, when we get small, um, small increases or increases in our, um, in our IPs outside of where we're operating, um, we have to then, um, we have to then fill those spaces with bait stations. So, uh, we're forecast to have around 800 at full deployment at this stage. Fantastic. Thank you, Nathan. I'll, I'll stop picking on you for now and, and, and I'll pick Thanks, on, on, on Shannon. Shannon, are you, are you there? I sure am. Oh, great. Shannon, we, we have some questions around um, the natural spread of Varroa. And can you 
talk to um, do we know the limits of the natural spread um, and that are they confined to around the IPs? From what we've uh, found so far from our surveillance data, there has been small amounts of natural spread in areas where we have high numbers of infested premises, but that natural spread is typically less than two or three kilometres from that infested premise. Um, and it's not around every single infested premise, uh, but it typically is in areas of high mite density. Um, so we are finding that occasionally, but they are generally well within the eradication zone. We're not finding that on the very limit of the eradication zone edge. Thanks. We're also getting some questions around mite numbers and hives and that sort of thing. And, and I think it, I could perhaps prelude to your answer that uh, it is very variable, but what we are seeing is around those IPs, there are high mite numbers and you might speak to the specifics, but a lot of the more recent detections that are on the edge of the red zone or just into the purple zone have actually been extremely low numbers. Yeah. Could you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the vast majority of infested premises that we are finding at the moment uh, do have very low mite numbers. And we have quite a number of sites where we've detected less than five mites on a sticky mat. So that's indicative of a very early stage of infestation in these hives, uh, that it hasn't been there for a significant period of time. Um, and we, we are seeing a bit of a curve. So right in the middle of the Newcastle uh, epicenter of the infestation, we tend to see much higher mite numbers. And as we go right towards the very edge of that large uh, eradication zone, we're seeing very low mite numbers. So there definitely is, is a concentration of high mite numbers into the centre parts of that Newcastle zone. Uh, we're not typically seeing very high mite numbers on the edge of the red zone, which is a good sign. Great, thanks Shannon. Um, and I've got some questions for Chris. So you're off the hook for now, Shannon. Chris. So you're on mute, there we go. So Chris, we're getting a lot of questions around compliance and we can't just rely on beekeepers and goodwill doing the right thing. Um, can you just inform us about what's happening in the compliance space? Yeah, sure. Um, so we obviously have a fairly well-established uh, movement declaration process for movement of bees in the blue zone. Um, and we have a permit process for movement of bees in purple zones. So in the surveillance zones. Um, and that, is, that has been what's assisted us to get uh, hives into, for example, the Nana Glen pollination areas to do rubus and blueberry pollination uh, and minimize impacts on those industries. So we have relatively good visibility of where people are moving hives to and when they're moving those hives. And what that does is it creates a picture um, of hive movement at different times of the year. Obviously, um, when borders are closed and, and beekeepers were unable to go across uh, into Queensland or into Victoria, um, it, it was very much confined to New South Wales. Uh, and, and so that, that's given us, I guess, an intelligence picture of where people are moving hives. Um, couple that with obviously the high risk of, of people potentially doing the wrong thing, uh, trying to move um, varroa mite infested hives out of red zones um, and out of, and potentially varroa mite infested zone, uh, infested hives out of purple zones. So we've been um, working with um, our colleagues at the New South Wales Police Force who have put an operation in, in play now um, where they are assisting us by checking um, for the appropriate documentation um, when people are moving beehives. Uh, and so they are out there on the roads uh, looking for um, bee trucks uh, and vehicles carrying beehives, pulling people over, um, asking to see the appropriate, um, the appropriate paperwork in place, be that a hive movement declaration um, or a permit, depending on where you are. Uh, and there is the option there to issue on the spot fines of $2,000 for people who are not um, carrying the correct documentation on them. Um, so that's one of the ways that we're trying to get greater um, or a greater number of eyes on the road, uh, looking at who's moving and, and what's actually happening in that process. Um, and uh, DPI is also conducting active investigations. Um, I did see some of the, the questions being answered with the number of investigations and fines and pins that have been issued so far by DPI compliance. Um, and so there's a couple of things that we can do. We, um, if you see people uh, moving 
these and you're not sure whether they should be and they're in an area where you think they shouldn't be, for example, you can ring through the hotline and report that to us. Um, and we we can then look at how best to tackle that, whether it is, if that's something that's currently happening, we can pass that on to the local police to look at, um, or otherwise we can follow up if it's after the fact uh, through our compliance investigation unit. Um, and there have been people who have been uh, issued with penalty infringement notices um, because of public reporting uh, in that manner. And the other thing that I would encourage people to do, particularly around um, wild bee baiting, uh, you know, we are aware that there are some groups um, that are uh, discussing negative acts online. Um, and if so, if you see anything that you think is suspicious, you can report that to Crime Stoppers. There is an open uh, Crime Stoppers uh, investigation or intelligence collection point um, for the response. So Crime Stoppers are assisting us in collecting that information and then looking at what can be done. Um, and the same goes if you see people vandalising um, a bait station or vandalising government property, you can also report that to your local police station or phone it through to Crime Stoppers. Excellent. Thanks, Chris. Um, I'm going to let you off the hook now and I'm going to drag Shannon back on for one last question before we wind up. Now, Shannon, we're getting a, um, quite a lot of questions about what genomic works has been happening. Are we even looking at how, how it got here and, and what the what the likeness of the of the mites mm -hmm. are? Is it the only incursion that we've seen? And do we know origin and that sort of stuff? Can you talk to perhaps some of the genomic work that's been happening in the background as well? Yeah, sure. Um, it's really important for us to try and understand how any exotic pest or disease comes into Australia. Uh, because we need to understand what mechanism it was using to get here and uh, then we can implement measures to try and shut down that pathway. So Varroa is no different. Uh, we have been collecting mite samples throughout the response uh, and undertaking genomic analysis of those mites to try and learn more about that population. Um, we, I have just actually sent through more samples in recent weeks, so we're actually going to rerun those analyses and it does take quite a bit of time to do that work. Um, we've been partnering with um, the Australian National University and with CSIRO and with DPI um, scientists as part of that process. It, it is very detailed and very complicated science and it does take time to go through that process. Um, if we're incredibly lucky, we will learn more about potentially the origin of the mite population, but it's extraordinarily challenging in the plant world because we currently have one page of a book uh, that is our varroa mite population we're trying to compare that page to a book in a library on the other side of the planet. And it relies on that book being present for us to try and match that page into it, um, particularly for human health pathogens, but also for animal health pathogens. That library is very extensive and very detailed. And so they have a very good chance of matching those pages into those books and into those libraries. The plant word often doesn't have that extensive a library. Um, so we have to see what we can work with. We may make a match at some point in time. We may not. Uh, we can only try and see what we can find. Um, it is a, a very complicated investigation. So it will take some time for us to get some of those answers pulled together. So we won't be releasing that data publicly anytime soon because there's quite a bit of investigation work around that. Um, what we have learned so far from the genetic analysis is that we are dealing with a, a genetically related population. So it has been one incursion event. It hasn't been, you know, event after event after event. Um, so that's also a good sign. Um, but there's still quite a bit of work to do in that space. And um, if we get lucky down the track and we can get some of those answers resolved, um, then we can work out the best way to communicate that information. But it, it's a long way down the track before we can get to that point if we're able to find that book that connects to our page in that international library. Thanks, Shannon. Um, and perhaps one question for myself I can ask was the last one. So we, there are a few questions in the chat about um, can recreational beekeepers have access to sticky mats? Mm -hmm. Some other questions about minocide strips. So sticky mats aren't regulated. Anyone can buy sticky mats and put those in their hives. And it is a monitoring technique used overseas to monitor mite loads and, and the natural drop of the mites. It isn't super sensitive, and it's certainly not a, a, a sensitive enough surveillance tool for the response, but they are certainly able to purchase those. In terms of beekeepers being used strips, 
be at the moment under the emergency response, um, there's an emergency use permit for miticides. They can only be used by authorised officers permitted by the department. So it is not available for beekeepers. Should that the response turn to um, management or transition to management, we as an industry have had shelf registrations of a lot of these chemicals and we're continually active and working towards getting more chemicals with shelf registrations ready to go. So if we get to that point, we can then start bringing those uh, miticides into the country and make them available for general use uh, for beekeepers. So there is a lot of work happening behind the scenes. Um, not naive in thinking that there's a 100% guarantee we can eradicate. Arbic's working very hard with all our other uh, associations to try and prepare um, and get those things in place. So having said that, we're, we're a good half an hour over time, um, but I think it was worth running that extra time. And, and I'd really like to thank our presenters uh, for staying back so late tonight and, and really deep diving on that information. I think it was fantastic. Again, I remind you that if you're watching this online in the, sometime in the future, that to check the websites to make sure you're up to date with the information because the information presented tonight was only current of the 11th of May. I'd also like to make a really big shout out to all the teams that are on the ground that are working for the DPI, for some 2,000, uh, sorry, the 200 staff that are out there every day working and doing some of those jobs that no one else will do. Uh, it's a huge effort. They're working long hours. They're putting the heart and soul into this response on behalf of the industry and they're doing a fantastic job in really challenging and trying circumstances. And we're aware that the response isn't perfect, that there are problems moving forward, but it is such a large response and it's going to be, it's been stood up so quickly that we'll work towards trying to make it better into the future. And this is, as um, Sir Tender, who I'm sure is online, always says, uh, we're trying to run a marathon at a sprinting pace. So we need to settle in for the long haul and we've got to be patient with this response and give it time, as Chris said, um, to provide the data and the confidence as we move forward. This is not something that we want to rush. And whilst we've got a chance of eradication, we need to make sure that we can take it. And I again thank the team behind the scenes, Bianca, Ali, Joe, Mark, um, for and, and Adrian as well online trying to field some of those questions and bring together. We've got a massive amount of questions that we will collate together uh, and we will use to inform our communications moving forward. Uh, and we'll see what the, uh, the best way of promoting uh, and answering those questions are um, through the public space. So thanks a lot for everyone attending. Um, we will get the uh, recording of this up online as quick as we can and, and enjoy your evening. Thank you very much.